Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Cam with Mining Journal and with me I have Jorge Ganosa, President and Chief Executive of previously Latin America focused Fortuna Silva, which entered West Africa last year through its merger with Rocks Gold. That deal added the Yaramoka mine to the company's production base uh, with the growth potential as well through the Seguela development project and nearby exploration opportunities. It's been an exciting transition, but not without its challenges. Welcome, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Fortuna is best known for its established production portfolio, mostly in Latin America. But I'd like to start with a development update, if that's all right. Um, you began building Seguela in September last year. How's that getting on? It's advancing uh, according to our, our plans and, and, and budget. Uh, as of the end of January, we announced a project advance of around 30%. We, we're aching closer to you know, 40% uh, now. Uh, and it's advancing well, according to our, 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 our budgets. Uh, and Seguela, as, as you mentioned, is, is part of a bigger story here. Uh, mid last year, we managed to uh, close the acquisition and, and business combination of, of Roxco, which is a platform for business in, in West Africa for, for the company now. And, and uh, most exciting gold jurisdiction, right? Uh, there is no other region in the world exhibiting the kind of growth in reserves, growth in gold production that uh, West Africa exhibits. You've mentioned uh, the, the opportunity there in West Africa with, uh, with, with resources, uh, in particular at Seguela, you've had some early discovery success or on top of the existing um, discovery success that underpins the operation, specifically the Sunbird discovery. How does that change the complexion of what you're actually building at Seguela? Does it alter your plans for the overall mine or is it just a, uh, is it just a situation where the mine life uh, extends? Let me start answering that question by saying that uh, coming into the Roxwell acquisition, a big driver for us uh, in the decision-making process was our view and, and, and uh, conviction on the exploration potential at Seguela, right? Uh, we are of the view that Seguela uh, is a cornerstone asset moving forward and one that can, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce and give the company opportunities for, for a much larger deposit over time. It is normal for, for companies that go into the construction phase to, to stop exploration activities, to focus on, on, on the build. Uh, we haven't done that. No, We, we have an aggressive uh, exploration program for 2022 while we are building. Uh, Sandbird, as you mentioned, is a reflection of, of, of that. And, and bear in mind that uh, Seguela, two years ago, was a 400,000 ounce uh, deposit with 400,000 ounces in resources. Today, it's a million ounce uh, uh, project, uh, 30, 40% advance in construction and, and still growing. Uh, so we have a 10 year plus life of mine that uh, in, in my view is, is with the success we're, we're seeing is gonna continue to grow. Uh, we have multiple targets. We have a sizable land package around Seguela. Uh, we will stick to the construction laid out in the feasibility study, uh, which calls for you know, about a 3,500, 3,600 ton per day a mining and milling operation. Uh, but we have no doubt that uh, at least we're adding life of mine or potentially uh, identifying opportunities for uh, near future expansions, right? I mean, uh, Seguel is just so prolific and, and we continue to show that. So we're building and aggressively continuing with, with exploration at, at that project, yes. Okay, and no issues with budget there, obviously, Jorge, in terms of keep, keeping those programs going on in parallel. No, no, not at all. Not at all. We are well funded to meet all of our capital demands. And that's one of the strengths of uh, and opportunities of bringing a project uh, like Seguela under the umbrella of a larger company, right? Uh, we we're well funded. We have a strong treasury and, and, and balance sheet, and, and we can manage 
the construction of, of the mine and, and, and the aggressive exploration program at the same time. This year, Fortuna has its largest capital budget in its history uh, between sustaining capital at the mines, Seguela construction and exploration or capital budget this year is $244 million. But, you know, we are in a very strong position to meet those capital commitments and, and, and retain a, a fortress balance sheet, right? Okay. And looking at uh, Iromoco going across to Burkina Faso, at the start of the year, well, we're still at the start of the year, uh, in January, um, a coup in that country there, not ideal, obviously. How is that affecting the operations there, um, if at all? And what are the likely outcomes as far as you're aware from your position in the country in terms of the probably near to midterm and, and, and likely impacts? Yes, you know, we, we all have to recognize that the political process in, in West Africa in particular still uh you know in in, in its uh, maturing phase to say it nicely uh, and this type of events are are not uh are not uh isolated or or, or a one-off event right so uh, operations were not disturbed something that we find across west africa that even though the political process is turbulent there continues to be a consistent support towards the fostering and developing of responsible mining in the region. No? Uh, there are articles written about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, something that drove us to, to, uh, to expand our business into West Africa is the fact that, you know, a fun fact, like, like my daughter say, China is the largest gold, uh, gold producer in the world. In 2020, it produced around 380 tons of, of gold. If we group the gold production of uh, countries in like uh, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Burkina Faso, Southern Mali, uh, Guinea, uh, if we group the gold production in that small geographic area, which fits within the state of Texas or, or half of Peru, for example, in terms of size. That region is the second largest uh, gold producer in the world, ahead of the US, Australia, Canada, Russia. No? So uh, you do not do that only with geologic potential. You need governments that over time support the development of responsible mining. And that is what we find. So even though, as I said, the political process is turbulent, we find consistent support to continue development of mining. Our operations were not disturbed. We do, didn't, did not lose one day of operations through, through the process, right? Okay, and we're talking a lot about gold ore here in terms of obviously production and its relevance on a global scale. Uh, the company Fortuna cut its teeth on silver production, obviously, across Latin America. Now with uh, Euro Merco, obviously adding to the portfolio, Seguela coming through another gold operation, Lindero, uh, obviously in Argentina, uh, a gold a gold producer. Are there thoughts about changing the company name to Fortuna Gold or at least Fortuna Precious Metals, something like that? You know, Fortuna is a 15, 16 year old company and uh, strategy has been evolving over time, right? So yes, at the very beginning, some 15 years ago, uh, our focus was uh, silver in Latin America, mainly in Peru or Mexico, which are the two largest, between the three largest, among the three largest silver producing countries in the world, right? So uh, bear in mind that in those days, silver was trading at around $3.80. And uh, no one was looking for silver. No? So it was uh, strategically, it made a lot of sense. Strategically, it made a lot of sense to be established in, in both Mexico and Peru. Uh, but since then, you know, the company has grown and, and, and uh, our strategy has had to evolve. So we expanded our reach to gold as well. Uh, that does not mean at all that we have given up on silver. It just means that you know we we continue to pursue silver and, and gold both with the same enthusiasm, right? Yeah. Uh, 
and now uh, in this search for for continued opportunities with a much bigger company uh, which with more broader not only financial resources but also human capital in the company uh, we decided to to expand no uh, to to west africa so today for 2022 you know, gold will account for around 20, 20, 70%, 65, 70% of revenue, silver for the 2025. And then we have uh, some byproduct, zinc and lead, which in this inflationary environment we are in, are behaving very well in terms of prices and, and, and it's an, always a welcome small byproduct inflow coming in, right? Uh, but, you know, we are not thinking or engaging in the discussion of changing the company name as of now. I think we have the bigger things to worry about. Uh, we're still committed to silver. As of the end of 2021, we have we had 12 drill rigs turning in the company across sites, of which eight were pursuing silver opportunities. Okay. Right. So. Uh, you know, and, and uh, a name change will be something anecdotically if it happens when it happens. Uh, but we are focused on, on both uh, silver and gold with the same enthusiasm, right? Okay. Okay. Well, I and mean and uh, just let me add one thing. <clears throat> An iconic primary silver producer, you might think of companies like Pan American Silver, for example. You know, uh, Pan American Silver's a silver contribution to revenue is around 30 percent. Mm. No, uh, so uh, the conundrum for silver producers is how to grow in 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 production, in metal output, uh, with quality assets, and, and retaining silver as a substantial percentage of revenue. Right? It's it's difficult because those assets are rare to come. Right? Focusing on the silver part of the portfolio, we are running out of time, Jorge, but I would like to get an update on how things are going across that Latin America portfolio, specifically with you know, the silver operations there. Um, uh, there are some challenges, but as you say, you've come through one of your better years on record. Yes. Uh, you know, or uh, across LATAM, you know, uh, we had some, uh, you know, permitting issues and, and, and challenges that we were able to overcome throughout 2021 uh, in the in the later half of the year one of our key permits was not renewed we managed to to uh, get authorities to focus on, on on the performance of our company and everything and get got that back right basically uh, we were in material compliance with all laws regulations and whatnot uh, Peru has been going through a turbulent political process as well. You know, Peru had five presidents in the last six years, right? So, uh, uh, but it has not impacted operations, no? Uh, and Argentina, we see our production more stable now, no? Uh, after, you know, this is a mine that we brought into production and commissions through the worst of COVID, mm. right? So. Uh, our ability to ramp up was was impaired by by those challenges in a country that basically locked itself right imposed severe travel restrictions it was difficult to get the right personnel in country and whatnot so the team has done a, a great job but there's been a toll in, in in a lengthy tortuous ramp up right but the operation that's behind us the operation is delivering stable so you know the latam portfolio is doing well Okay, and just very quickly before I let you go, Jorge, inflation pressures at the moment are a reality for miners across the world, developers across the world. How are you managing that? And are there different approaches for the Latin American portfolio versus the West African portfolio? Yes, we have, for example, gone into some uh, level of uh, diesel hedging for the Argentinian operation, for example. So we have hedged one of our bigger costs, uh, diesel in, our, in Argentina. Uh, that's one measure we've taken. Uh, with respect to the construction, for example, uh, Seguela, um, the project was ready to go into, into construction very early in, in, in July. 
uh, we decided to to take a pause with the team and and uh, have a deeper dive into potential uh, in the in the risks associated to to capex on on the inflation side right and 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 therefore we brought in the we increased the construction budget by 24 million dollars to 172 which is a budget now and those 24 million dollars are basically accounting for a uh, inflation of uh, you know uh, materials uh, equipment and uh, also the challenges with the supply lines no uh, uh, slower delivery times uh, freight cost uh, slower deliveries on freight so all of those considerations uh, were brought into our construction budget you know with that inflationary field of view uh, and, and, and an angle that we brought to the analysis right so uh, that amounted to 24 million dollars additional 24 million dollars coming in into our final public capex figure we came out with right so yeah. we we yeah absolutely there is inflation and you know it is sometimes the expectation of investors that when prices rise for commodity producers, our costs stay flat. <laughs> it's never the case. We aim to keep a, a growing margin, uh, but margins, uh, cost doesn't stay flat when we're in a uh, commodity price environment like we are right now. Understood. Jorge, thank you very much for your time. Jorge, good night, sir. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you.